thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. No, so am I, man. I've been following you for a minute. Um, your YouTube channel, you yeah. know, you're you're definitely a huge inspiration. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that means a lot. I appreciate it. No, you're doing it. You know, you're author, you're everything. And um, I say, I got to get her on. I say, you know, let me just, let me just hit her up. I was like, yeah, to start. <laughs> I mean, listen, you never know, right? <laughs> no, you never know. You got you to try it. And I've, I've always been doing that. So I'm like, you know, I'm not one to be shy. So I'm like, you know what? If I want somebody on, I'm just going to get them on. That's it. And I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to just ask you, like, you know, what got you into it? Like, you know, are you always this kind of motivated, inspiring person or did you have to grow into this? Um, so I truly believe everyone's purpose is found in everything that comes naturally to you. Yeah. So I've always been the supportive friend. I've always been the encouraging friend and, you know, people would always come to me for advice, but I didn't really know how that would look professionally. Right. Right. Um, so my first book started as a journal. Um, and I really was just journaling just to get things off my chest. I spent a year focused on like, self-growth, okay. loving myself and figuring out all of my baggage and, you know, growth on all levels. And I just journaled the process because writing is how I process things. Same here. So Same here. the first, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty honest, <laughs> um, for sure. And, um, I didn't realize it was going to be a book until I realized my story could help someone else. And it made my pain worth it by being able to help someone else through their process. The speaking piece, um, I kind of got uh, nudged into it. Uh, my sorority, Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, uh, my chapter president wanted to do a women's empowerment event. And I was like, great, I'll play in it. You know, I'll put it together. I'll do all the legwork, et cetera. Um, and she just put it out there. She was like, do we have any authors in the chapter? Like, it would be great to have, you know, authors presented on the on the speaking panel. And I was like, oh, well, my book will be out by then. And she's like, girl, you have to speak. Like, what? <laughs> um, and so my first speaking engagement, I kind of was uh, next to the corner. And it was really when I discovered this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is who I was created to be as a motivational speaker. And being an author just kind of helps you take it beyond that day and like giving you applicable solutions and my YouTube channel. And I I'm just constantly looking for different ways to pour into others. And just challenging um, taboo subjects is my favorite thing to do, because I think we need to talk about some things. Um, mm -hmm. In an open way, for sure. Yeah, especially in a black and brown community. Absolutely. You know, I know, Absolutely. You know I'm from New York. I'm, I'm Puerto Rican, and you know, um, my little girl, you know, she's Afro Latina, so I have to show her how to be a black woman, a Latin woman, and just a woman. Period. Exactly. Right. Exactly. You know, and my wife has to show her that as well. Mm -hmm. And right then, and there, you already have insecurities built up. Exactly. From from the start, let yep. alone with, with social media. And what the regular people around are going to put that upon Absolutely. someone. Absolutely. And I, when I think of me as a black woman, I think of it's, you can think of it as a double minority. Right. Or you can think of it as a double superpower. Like I have women's yeah. intuition and I have melanin. Like, in my opinion, <laughs> that makes me unstoppable. It really does. There it is. It's just badass shit. <laughs> so, like black girl magic is a real thing. And I think you know, Malcolm X had it pinned correctly. Like the most disrespected person in America is the black woman. And it's a, it's a real statement, but at the same time, we're such a strong people. Like we've been through hell and high water and we will still come out, you know, look smelling like roses. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. I mean, the biggest thing too, I feel is that, we we tend to perform, and what I mean by that, we tend to fake the funk Absolutely. a lot a lot more better than we are about really executing what we Absolutely. need to get done. Absolutely, we're really good at uh, making it look pretty. Yeah, man, and I hate that because you, know, you have we have brilliant people in the culture, mm -hmm. and you know those people do shine, but then the majority of people kind of just sit back and either they hate, right, or they feel stuck. Yeah, yeah. You know? As a development coach, I definitely run into a lot of my clients getting in that stuck space. 
and, you know, trying to walk them through it and things like that. But it, what I've learned is that action is the solution. And a lot of times we wait until we feel like doing something. And if you're never going to feel like it. No, you're not. Like, I don't feel like getting gonna... up today. I got I got I got this. I got to work. I got up for work at four o'clock this morning. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. Like you're people who are doing things are the people who are working sun up to sun down, working yeah. when they don't feel like it, working when they're sick. You know, I wake up every morning at like five in the morning and I'm working nonstop until like ten o'clock. You know what I mean? Like and I work really, really, really hard six days out of the week. And then one day a week. I try to rest. <laughs> That's what I do. M- Mondays is my rest day. Yeah, for sure. I mean, but it, but at the same time, you have people who you can either make time or you can make excuses. And way too many people choose the latter. No, you're right. I think a lot of people tend to make a lot of excuses. And then it, they tend to glorify just being busy as well. Yeah, yeah. But then there's no result. There's no outcome yeah. from it. You know, they're not bettering themselves. They just want to post that they're busy 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 mm-hmm. but they really haven't changed the mindset yet i agree i agree and mindset is everything once you're able to change your mindset i think you can do anything but it really starts with believing that you can and a lot of my clients when when we first get started the most common excuse you hear is i don't have time yeah. and i really walk them through like okay there's 24 hours in a day. You need to sleep for eight. You work for eight. Your commute time. Like, let's put every excuse yeah. in the book and really just do the math. And we're finding like 30, 50 hours a week. And then you sit there and think, well, what did you do with that? that those 50 hours? Like, what have you done with your time? You binge watch uh, Netflix. <laughs> exactly. But the thing about it is people don't even realize they have that much time accessible to them. It's right. a matter of they they really do believe like I don't have time, but with your budget, you have to budget your finances and you have to budget your time or it will squander away and you won't even realize it. So, you know, the first couple of weeks that I work with any of my clients, it's always like, let's budget your money, let's budget your time so that we can actually make progress and not just No, yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right about that. It's a matter of it's funny because you, you deal with the smartest people in the world, but they don't know how to just get started. Yeah. You know, you know, like you said, they get stuck. And, you know, I've read multiple motivational books, inspirational books. No, I, I, I listen to other podcasts and mm. I've done this for years and right. I've always wanted to write. And I didn't publish my first books until last year. Okay, congrats. And so I, yeah, because I decided to take my second half of my life and say, you know what, I'm going to control it the way I want to control it and finally do what I want to do. Right. But I doubted my writing at first. I wasn't I felt like I wasn't good enough to you know what I mean I have the right look or the right voice to be on the podcast and then I already was shooting myself down before anybody else could shoot me down. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then, you know, motivation to me or inspiration is great, but then you gotta have that drive behind it because you're not gonna be there for you know, for the whole long run with your client. You're there for that spark. You're there for that hey to get to get you started. You know, so how do you I guess drill into them that they got to form some type of drive. Absolutely. And I think it forms with accountability. Um, I am a tough love kind of coach. Um, I give loving accountability. I'm not going to belittle you. I'm not going to curse at you. I'm not going to yell at you. Like that's just not who I am as a person, Right. but I'm also not going to tolerate your excuses. Yeah. And with every, all of my sessions, you get homework and I can tell if you've done your homework or not. Right. I know, I know if you're putting in the work, I know, and I make it very clear, like, listen, I believe in you and I'm here with you, but I'm not going to outwork you on your dreams. Yeah. No, you're right. It's like, you know, there's no difference how I tell my kids, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to meet you 50% of the way. Like, right. you know, you, you need help. I, I don't mind helping you, but I'm not going to do it for you. Exactly. You and know, you can see the difference. Like I have two clients that started at the same time and I can, there's a noticeable difference because one is putting in the work. And the other is not. And the one that wasn't, I had to have a heart to heart with her. And I was like, listen, I'm pushing you because I know you're capable. But right now you're not delivering what you could. Yeah. 
and you're shooting yourself in the foot and you're squandering your money, even though we talked about budgeting, you're squandering your time, even though we talked about planning your schedule, you know, and just really, we had to have, like, I paused her sessions and I was like, listen, we can't move forward if you're not willing to put in the work. Yeah. And within a week, she like, you know, and sometimes it just takes people holding you to a higher standard and not willing to accept you're just average. No, right. I think people get confused that um that you have to freaking work. Yeah. They, I don't think they really get that notion. And I think they see other people successful. Mm-hmm. They see other people doing things, but they don't look at the work that goes behind it. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like I tell my kids all the time, like, you know, I grew up with hip hop. So growing up in New York with hip hop, you've seen all the flashy cars, all the gold chains. Mm-hmm. But even with the artists, they don't tell you how hard they are they work in the studio to make that song. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what you miss. Yeah. So even for me, like I I've been working on my business for three years. And for the last two years, I have spent every single day committed to working on my business and I call it earning my sleep like I don't look at sleep as a I like that I have to earn it every (laughs) single day or I can't go to sleep and I like sleep (laughs) (laughs) I love sleep it really pushes me like okay what am I going to do today that's going to push my business a little bit further and you really just have to realize and it takes 10,000 hours to be a success but the the world doesn't see that 10,000 hours and they think you're an overnight success. Correct. No, baby. Yeah. I've been putting in work. Okay. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not even, I'm just getting, you know what I mean? To a point where, you know, people are starting to notice people are starting to like, Oh, you're always doing this. Oh, you're always having speaking engagements. Yeah. It's like, I'm out here hustling for what I believe I'm designed to do. No, no yeah, I, I think you're actually right. I think that's where people tend to fall short. And and they get a taste of it, yeah. And then like, oh man, I got to do this again tomorrow and again. And yeah. and when you plateau, you know, even when you you grind it out, you hit kind of a plateau. And you even question yourself sometimes, like, yo, is is this yeah. really paying off? Yeah, definitely. You know what I'm saying? It could, you, yeah. It's like it's almost like a self check. Like you take an inventory of yourself and I say, oh, is this the right thing to be doing? Yeah. And if you know for sure this is what you're supposed to be doing, you, know, you get up the next day. You know what? Let me keep on grinding yeah. and go for it. But people are looking to monetize everything so fast though. Yeah, everybody and, wants that quick bag, you know? Exactly. And yes, money pays the bills, but at the same time, you do have to hustle your way up. Like, you know, I think about, like, for example, B2K. They were the first concert I, I had ever gone to, How obviously, like, back in the day. But my the first concert I went to theirs was completely free. And within one year, they were, like, mega superstars. You know what I mean? And so maybe a lot of people didn't know who, like, when I went to their first concert, I didn't know who they were before then, but my right. father took me, you know, I was a teenage girl. He's like, oh, I mean, it's a free concert in D.C. Why not? Right. Um, and within a year, their tickets were like hundreds of dollars. Like, you have to put in that work for people to even know who you are. And, you know, especially as a motivational speaker, like, people aren't going to just pay you with no experience or no, no real yeah. For them to even look at, them. baby, you gotta be humble. <laughs> like you know, your first couple years, you may not be getting paid, and you gotta figure that out. And if you this is really what you want, you have to p- be patient and build up your 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 video reel so that you can qualify to be paid to speak. Like I'm not spending money sight unseen. No, you're right. I think that's where people have to really look at look at themselves and start valuing themselves more. Yeah, yeah. You know, and understand that 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 hard work is adding stock to you. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and then once people see that stock, they want it. Yeah. They want a piece of that stock, and then you can say, no, no doubt, you can have it for the cool price. Uh, <laughs> you know, X, Y, and Z. Exactly. <laughs> and you know, as you become more experienced and as you grow your business, you can start to ask for more. But you also have to understand, like, let's be clear. You know. My first couple, my first couple of clients, I did pro bono because I was gaining experience. Now I pay, I charge what I think I'm worth, you know, and that worth is going to grow as I continue. But at the same time, you also have to be realistic because people know when you're fresh into it. 
Like yeah, they, they, you, you give off that new car smell. Yeah, you do. You smell like that, that, that fresh plastic and leather. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's funny because like, like, well, it was not funny. Like, you know, last year, I, I know even my, I had a great career, and I only have an eighth grade education, mm-hmm. right? And I got my GED in my early mid twenties, and I, I built, I built myself, and. The one thing I didn't have, the quality I didn't have, was vulnerability. Yeah. And as a man, you know, that's that's, a, that's, a weak, that's right away a weakness. You're taught don't be vulnerable. You, know, you can't even cry when you scrape your knee type of stuff. So we already kind of have that built-in PTSD, right, growing up. Right. And then growing up in the hood in Brooklyn, like, you already had to have a mean grill because you can't smile on no one. you got to be tough all day. Yeah. And not until recently when I decided to be vulnerable is when I started seeing even a more greater success but more of a successor where I'm happy with myself now. Yeah. And it's not a form of weak. It's not being soft. It's not being weak. I think people confuse that a lot too. Like they say, oh, I can't be vulnerable or I'm going to be taken advantage of type of thing. Vulnerability is actually one of the greatest strengths that mm-hmm. I think I possess. And because it takes courage to be honest, it takes courage to put yourself out there. It takes courage to be truthful. And I think part of, you know, and just, my guesstimation, but part of the reason why you're probably feeling more fulfilled is because you're not having to wear a mask and cover up who you are. You can just be who you are. Um, And especially with me as a motivational speaker and as I'm growing um, in my, you know, the awareness that people have about me, like it becomes harder to be vulnerable because people expect you to be positive. People expect you to be encouraging and and, in a great mood and uplifting. And I'm like, I had bad days too, guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I'm not always going to be, you know, in a great space, you know. And you, if you catch me like an hour before a speaking engagement, I'm just as quiet because I'm very introverted. Right. And so I may be quiet. I don't really have much to say. Like, I, because I know it's going to take that energy. And afterwards, like every time I have a speaking engagement, I get some fried chicken and I take a nap. I'm tired. Like, yeah. It. <laughs> no, it's 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 a lot. I think that's what people don't understand. Like, especially like, like that's kind of like your game time. That's your game face. You game prepared. Exactly. You know, and um, I'm the kind of I'm very much the same way. I'm very introverted, and but I had to work on it. Yeah. Yeah. Because if I if I didn't work on it, we wouldn't be talking. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And, and there's a difference between recognizing your personality types and allowing that to stop you. Yeah. So, yes, I'm introverted. Yes, I'm shy. Yes, I like to keep to myself. But when it comes to my business, like, I force myself to put myself out there. I force myself. And it is almost like wearing a face. Like, I, I'm, I've i become a social introvert. Like, I'm willing to push myself further than what I'm comfortable with right. because I know for example, my first couple of speaking engagements, like I reached out like, hey, I see you have this event going on. Do you need a speaker? And I may ask 10 people, but if I get two yeses, I'm good. Oh, absolutely. You, you won. I've won. I can't think about those eight no's. And a lot of people let those eight no's get them down or, you know, non-response. Like, you don't have to respond to me. That's OK. Like, right. it's OK. But the two people who did, I'm good with that. So let me ask you this, like, um. Well, you're helping these people out, right? And and, you, and you're trying to inspire them and they hire you for that. Mm-hmm. Do you ever come into kind of a battle with their friends or family where they're just kind of damning them pretty much in, the, in, the, in that negative space and it's affecting what you're trying to do with them? Absolutely. And I know a lot of times we like to think of families as these loving, supportive, you know, uplifting environments, but that's not always the case for oh. everyone. And in those moments, you just have to learn boundary setting. And that's what I tend to work on those kind of clients with. Like, okay, even if you're absolutely 100% by yourself, cool. You can still make this happen. You just have to set healthy boundaries. And if you have negative people in your life, I strongly recommend block, delete, repeat. Block, delete, repeat. If you have friends in in their life who are negative or not lifting or, you know, comfortable with the status quo, you need to distance yourself from them. And yes, that's harder to do with family, but you can still create healthy distance. 
and you can start to put limits on how much time you can spend with them. You start, you know, silencing your phone, whatever it is that you need to do, but you still have responsibility for your life and what type of energy you allow into your circle. So, you know, even if it's a holiday, cool. Schedule your time with your family. Like I can only, I have to leave at three, you know, or whatever that time frame looks like for you. But boundary setting is going to be key, particularly when it's family, um, because you can't really like delete family. <laughs> no, and I think you have to be okay with people talking shit too. You can't you can't worry about that, exactly. you know, because people are gonna talk behind your back. People are gonna say, "Oh, now you're too busy. Now, now, now you're too much for us," you know. Yeah. But then again, it's also because those people don't either have their own inspiration or their own goals. Correct. So they're kind of upset. They know what you found yourself. Exactly. And what I've learned is that other people's opinion of you is none of your business. Uh huh. Good, bad, or ugly, like regardless what their opinion states you can't really be concerned about someone else's opinion because you can't control it. It's, it has nothing to do yeah. with you. And a lot of times we have to realize like hurt people hurt people. Yeah. Wow. So the same person who's not encouraging your dream, maybe their dream got scolded when they were two or three or five, you know? So we really have to, when it comes to family, you have to dig deeper and understand what's causing these reactions and give people grace, but also set boundaries at the same time. Yeah, I was watching one of your, your videos. I saw your head, you had a speaking engagement. Mm -hmm. And what I was doing was watching, you was great, by the way. Thank you. Um, yeah. But then I was also watching the body language of a lot of the women that were there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I saw some women taking notes. I saw some women, women shaking their heads and, 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 and agreeing with you. Then I saw some women kind of taking it back. They weren't really participating. Yeah. Or, you know, they had their hands kind of close to them, kind of that, that blocking mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's almost like they just deterred themselves from being open. Because I guess they've been scarred so much that I know oh, no, this is my protective state. She sounds good, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how do, how do you how do you get through to those types of, of women or people for that matter? Yeah. Um, and I agree. And I, as you can see it in the video, like some people are like, you know, who, who, who she's going to yeah. say. And then there's some people who are like, mm, I'm here. Um, and at the end of the day, I have to recognize that if you're not ready for it, that's OK. Right. But the people who are ready, that's who I'm here to touch. Yeah. And I focus on who I can have an impact with and as a motivational speaker, it's my goal to connect with everybody in the room. But also recognizing there are some people who are just reflective people. So it may come across as, you know, I'm just here, but maybe they're thinking that deep level thinking, and maybe that's the greatest connection. It just doesn't look like it. Right. Um, and so at the end, of, you know, and at the end of that conference, like a lot of people came up to me and was like, oh, you know, I want to connect with you, you know, blah, blah. Um, a lot of people purchased the book. And so it's really just a matter of making sure that I'm, making a conscious effort to connect with everyone in the room, but understanding even as a speaker, even as a coach, I can't do the work for you. I can lead you to the well, but I cannot force you to drink. Mm -hmm. And if you're not ready to drink, if you're not thirsty, God bless America. At a minimum, the seed was planted. And when you're ready for it, you'll be like, oh, I remember when. And yeah. you just have to take comfort in that and knowing that, I did my best. I prepared. I was ready. And who it was supposed to resonate with, it did. So do you still get inspired by other folks? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so my mentors who don't know they're my mentors, uh, Lisa Nichols is one of my favorite motivational speakers. Um, Les Brown is my, I would say he's my second favorite motivational yeah. speaker. Um, as far as a business owner, Candy Burris is my biggest inspiration. Um, I, I'm constantly flooding my mind with, I have a YouTube playlist that I'm just watching different people and, you know, taking notes and applying videos. And sometimes I'll post those videos to my business page and, you know, just, I'm always looking for inspiration because I have to make sure my cup is full so that I can pour into other people. 
No, that's that's great. I think you have to. I think if you're a writer, you have to read. Yeah. Right. If you love music, you have to listen to it. Like you have to be really involved into what you're doing and respecting your colleagues and learning. And, and it's, it's it's a it's a whole kind of you know passing knowledge to one another. Right. And, learning from each other too. Yeah. I think that, that, I don't think we do that too well. You know, we have to really get better at that as well. And and having people like yourself, it's fantastic because we don't see that a lot. Yeah. You you no, just don't. Well, I've I've realized a lot of people are talented. We all have different talents in our world. It's phenomenal. But a lot of people rest in that talent. Yeah. And I can't afford to. Like, yes, I'm gift. Yes, I'm talented. Yeah doing what I created to do, but I still need to work on my craft and I still need to perfect my skill. So that speech that you just recently saw at the Keep Your Head Up conference, I practiced for two months for a 20-minute session. You see what I'm saying? Like, it's more than just, like, I wanted it to be committed to memory. I wanted to make sure that it flowed properly. I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss any important parts. Like, I had it bullet pointed out, but, like, I, I was repeating it on in the shower. I was repeating it driving to work. I was repeating it, you know, on a lunch break, whatever. I, I, while I was cooking, I was motivating my pots and pans. Like, it was just a matter of, like, I wanted this to be, you know, dynamic. And every time I have a speaking engagement, it's the same thing. Like, I'm not going to just show up. Yes, I have the ability to just show up because I'm naturally gifted in that. But why should the artist deserve is my best effort, and that's what I'm going to provide to them. No, I love that we just said, you know, you, you, you're you showing up. And that's what a lot of people have to get better at, showing up. Yeah, yeah. You know, showing up, and then, and just really, I think, giving that helping hand and really helping that next person out. And to your point, like you said, you know, you're not going to help everyone unless they want to be helped, unless they, you know, they're doing the work for it. And th- there's been plenty of times, you know, like I- I've seen someone or a-, or a colleague or coworker, and I'm like, man, you need some help. I'll help you out. And they're just kind of just milking you dry of your energy. Yeah, yeah. Energy is transferable, and I have to be really careful whose energy I, s- I connect with. Um, so I'm very strategic on a friend level. I'm very strategic on a business level and making sure that, for example, um, I – considered a business opportunity with one of my friends and we're really great friends and have been for years. But from a business perspective, we have different operating tools. So we had to hurry up and back out of that because it was going to threaten our friendship. Sure. And, you know, it it was funny. We never really talked about it. We kind of just like, "Mm," (laughs) you know, separated from the, from the project. And does that mean that project's not going to happen? Absolutely not. But what I've learned is, just because we have a great friendship does not mean we need to be in business together. Correct. And our energy business-wise is too different that we're not going to be cohesive. No, you're right. I think that's what people have to get better at. But I think with time, you know, you get to learn that, especially when you get to learn more about yourself, though. For sure, like, for sure. You know, and, and I think that's where um, last year I had that kind of awakening of myself when I got to really know myself the mindset, the kind of, I just, the switch was always there. I just didn't know it was, it was there. Mm-hmm. And I finally hit the switch. And yeah. it was like, I need to start thinking and acting differently. I need to start putting myself in places, in different positions, uncomfortable positions at that too. Mm-hmm. Um, I think making yourself uncomfortable and taking the road with the most bumps in it. Yeah. It feels <laughs> just stamina. <laughs> it really does. It, it does. And I think, it's funny that you say that because that's really true. Um, but when you take the road with a lot of bumps, like you start to get used to it. You're like, okay, this yes. is just how it works. But if you're on a smooth road and then you hit the the slightest of a bump, you're like, oh my God, the world's over. And yeah, absolutely. It was just a pebble. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> it's like that 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 that, that uh, cartoon ants when the leaf falls between the ants and they get stuck. They don't know what to do. <laughs> Someone has to guide them around it. And it's like, yeah, it's like, man, that's it's crazy. But again, like you know, we're not taught that because our parents probably weren't taught that, right? So you only know as much as your as your parents do. You know, yeah. they they yeah. teach you, to, hey, you know what? Stay your job for thirty years and get a pension. But well, that that doesn't exist anymore. Exactly. Exactly. You know? And the way of thinking that you had to have is, you know, 
I, you know, it's a, it's a cliche saying, you know, you got to think outside the box. You have to think broadly. You got to discover. And that's what you have to really do. Take, you only have one life. Mm-hmm. And we know it's very finite, right? We don't, we don't get to live forever. So it's like, what are we doing in our time besides just working, right? Yeah. Because yeah. working takes up half your lifetime, literally, right? What are you doing for your passion? You know, what are you doing for your purpose? And I know you talk about purpose and, Absolutely. you know, finding that. So, how, you know, when you found your purpose, where did that feel like for you when you said that, that kind of light bulb went off? Yeah, I think it felt great. I'll say that. It definitely felt great. And I don't know that I found my purpose until I went through my greatest amount of pain. And that was when I turned 25. And every year prior, like I always knew I was going to be an entrepreneur, didn't know what. Right. I always knew that one day I'd be famous, didn't know what, you know, I'm not the best singer. I think like in my heart, I'm a singer, but like (laughs) it doesn't always translate. (laughs) Um, (laughs) You have that inside voice. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Like my my voice is perfect for the shower in the car. Yeah. But that's about it. Um, And, you know, growing up, motivational speakers weren't famous. Yeah. I mean, like, and so, you know. Neither were entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs, like, you know. Entrepreneurs weren't famous. And, you know, you you, there were entrepreneurs, but they were just, you know, the local mom and pop shop or what have you. So I never really knew what my future looked like, but I knew it was going to be full-time entrepreneurship. And I knew I was going to help people. Again, didn't know how. And I always wanted, because I knew found I'd be unstoppable and so when I discovered my purpose sometime in my 25th year I was like yeah like this this feels right this is it this is what I'm gonna do I'm gonna you know fight for it and I was that's when I started doing the earn your sleep thing so Nicole's network actually I started YouTube channels just because and Motivational Monday started about three years ago. Actually, um, the end of this month will be my my third year officially. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but it wasn't until May 2017 that I was like, listen, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to hustle. I'm going to get it together, you know, et cetera. So, you know, it was really just a matter of learning yourself is step one and and then learning what naturally feels right and then doing as much of that as you can and then growing into what that looks like for you yeah i think people don't understand that there's a there's a separate education process when you're growing absolutely you you know there's one with yourself that gets to really learn about who you are who you really want to be because you tend to block out when you're a kid you're so pure right Mm -hmm. You have all these dreams, and somewhere, by the time you hit preteen to teenage years, something goes awry. Yeah. To where you just tend to all these bridges are are knocked down for you, all these walls are built up for you, and then that innocence and that 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 drive and that kind of dreamy aspect go away. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what the hell happened? And then I know that happened to me. Is that could you get so caught up in the everyday life yeah. of things? You know what's cool, what's not cool, and then you get caught about who's doing what and and where they're at, and if they're successful, man, how come I'm not? You start questioning yourself, and it's like, you know what? That's that's where you you have to kind of just stop and, re- and reopen yourself again and say, you know what? Let me start. Let, can I go back to that feeling again? Mm-hmm. You know, and being unsure. Like now, I'm comfortable with being unsure, and I kind of like it. It's a good it's a good creative space for me now, Absolutely. where before it's kind of a scary space. Like, oh man, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I want to do. Let me not say that out loud too much. Because mm-hmm. then I don't want to be judged. Yeah. And I think we, in general, need to learn to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. Yeah. And a lot of times fear stops people because it's yeah. scary. And it is scary. And that's okay. Yes. Fear is an emotion, just like love, hunger, happiness. Like all of it is an emotion that is communicating something to you. But a lot of times people interpret fear as stop as opposed to dig deeper, work harder, work smarter. Right. And so when you recognize that something is scary, you're supposed to feel the fear, 
Yes. Hear what is communicating to you, and then still do it. Yeah, you put use it as as energy for exactly. you to go forward with it. Because I think I think people are afraid of the unknown. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and so that next step, if you already have everything planned out, and all of a sudden you you get to the end of your plan or you get to the summit of your goal, well, what's next? You know, you don't stop. You know, and you just have to figure shit out. That's what happens. Like, you're gonna fail. Exactly. You're, suppo- you're supposed to. <laughs> Okay, and some of your greatest lessons are gonna be wrapped up in sandpaper. Like, they hurt. It's yeah. all right, but if the difference is, I think with me versus a lot of people, I'm willing to take the risk. And if I fail, so be it. But if and when I fail, I'm digging deep to see. Okay, what can I learn from it? How can I prevent this moving forward? What was the lesson? Why did I go through this? Was this preventable? Is it something I couldn't do? Control, like, all of these different lessons so that we ain't ever got to come here again. No, yeah. And I think a lot of people, too, tend, tend to sabotage themselves, though. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll definitely sabotage themselves from being successful on their own because of that fear. Mm-hmm. And they they haven't experienced it or they feel like, hey, maybe I'm the only one feeling this. In the, in the whole planet, and no, you're you're one of seven billion people, and everyone has felt this fear. You're not alone in it, yeah. and it's, it's weird how we just think that way. Like we're always so unique, yeah. And it's like no, this we're human. Like we all have the same feelings, exactly. You know, and I, I know for myself, like you know, growing up, it was it's always been like you know, the old school way of trying to be a man, mm-hmm. and then you see today how millennials are different, mm-hmm. and it's like man, like you know. I kind of like millennials a little bit. I don't like them all the time, but <laughs> <laughs> but I I do I do think they get a bad rap about being lazy. I I think they're they want to be more free. Yeah. You know, they, that's the generation right now that has the most passports compared to the last generation. Mm-hmm. They want to travel more. They want to be yeah. more. And I think as, as a loving millennial, <laughs> I, I actually love the fact that I'm a millennial. Um, but I think. Yes, we get a bad rap about so many different things. Um, a lot of things that Gen X is responsible for, because yep. like y'all raised us. But okay. Um, <laughs> but the right. one thing that I will say is millennials are not willing to just accept status quo simply yeah. because you told me this is what it's supposed to look like. Right. So that's why you see us you know, fighting for entrepreneurship so much more. That's why you see us traveling so much more. Are you just Making a concerted effort to figure out oh, what do I want and how can I go about that? Like millennials are delaying marriage. Why? We grew up in a lot of divorced or single parent homes. Correct. Absolutely. I don't want that for myself. So I'd rather wait or not do it at all. And and that's what you're seeing. And you're seeing, you know, a lot of millennials are going for advanced degrees more often, you know, and a lot of millennials are starting their own businesses and I was having this conversation with someone uh, on my video blog last week and a someone I was like, I think generation Z, which is like the next one after us, they're the first generation that has a, a shot at full-time entrepreneurship right out the gate because you yeah. have changed that culture. We've questioned the fact, okay, do I really need to have a traditional job? Oh, I can make money doing what I actually enjoy doing. Yes. Yeah. You know, and so we're, we've been the first generation to challenge that, like, go to school, get a job, retire. It, uh, I don't want to wait until I'm 60 something no. to enjoy life. And a lot of people who have, re- like, a lot of baby boomers who are now retired sit at home all day and do nothing. Yeah. I don't want that. Like, I worked way too <laughs> hard for 40 plus years to go sit at home and, and sleep all day. Like, no. what? No, I, I totally agree with that. I think, I think you're absolutely right with that. Um, You know, I'm constantly reminded because I have kids or millennials and kids are going to be part of Generation Z. And if I didn't teach them what I've learned so far mm-hmm. and how to be free thinkers and go after what they want to go after and say, hey, school is an option. You don't have to do it. Yeah. And if you don't like it, that's fine. Don't stop your education. But formal schooling is just different, exactly. you know, and they're just trying to get your money at that point. But if you want to go ahead and expand your your wealth of knowledge, go travel. Yeah. Go surround yourself with, with people who are a level or two above you. 
you know, don't surround yourself with people who are either at your level or below you because you're going to get stuck. You're going to feel like, hey, you know what? If you're the best thing, best person in your group, you've outgrown your group. Absolutely. And I think it's more so about not just, you know, if you don't like school, go, don't go to school, but like learning what you want to do up mm -hmm. front. And, you know, for example, so, and I like to always clarify the youngest millennial is 22. Like, right. I think millennial and Gen Z gets grouped into this one big old category. They do. We're not the same people. <laughs> um, but so when I think about the difference between myself, who's a millennial, and then my younger sister, who's a Gen Z, she's graduating high school this year and she's going to Full Sail University to be a fit to study as a film director. Like, and she often compares herself to me because I'm her big sister and she wants to, you know, live up to my accomplishments and all this other stuff. And I'm like, listen, had I known my purpose when I went to school, like, you know, I, so full sale is not cheap by any stretch of the word. Right. And I went to school, um, my undergraduate degree, I went completely like full scholarship. And so she was comparing herself to that. And I was like, but honestly, I went and got a degree because that was what I was supposed to do. If I knew what I wanted, I could have been a whole lot more strategic during my time. I went to Virginia Tech. Now, I could have still gone to Virginia Tech for free, but I could have walked out the door. You know, I could have been more strategic with my refund checks. I right. could have been building my business while I was in school. I would have had a different major. Like, I my time at tech would have been completely different had I been 13 and knowing that this is what I wanted to do. She's known she wanted to be a film director since she was a teenager. That's amazing. She's 13 and maybe even 11. You know what I mean? So going into school, knowing this is my purpose, this is what I was called to do, it gives you a different focus as opposed to going to school because you're supposed to. Right. And, okay, fine. Let me pick a major that I kind of enjoy, you know? Yeah, yeah I worked with plenty of people who had criminal justice degrees, psychology degrees, a history major, English major, and they're right next to me in cubicle next to me. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. And, yeah. and so, you know, not saying that education is pointless, but what I'm saying is if you're going to go to get your education, yeah. it's much more effective if you already know what your purpose is. And I think yeah. because millennials have changed the culture on, so for example, baby boomers, they worked because you had to pay bills. They went through yeah. the depression. They it wasn't time for fun. Gen X was the first gen, like you had the feminist movement. You had um, they were born through you know the civil rights movement. You know they were starting to change that status quo. And a lot of Gen X have become entrepreneurs, but later in life. Correct. Um, millennials are becoming entrepreneurs in their twenties and thirties. And so now we're getting to Gen Z where they're starting to go off to school. They're starting to join the workforce and things like that. And they're now at the point where it's like, okay, do I want a traditional job? Like they, we're now at the point where they can ask, what do I want for myself? No, and you're absolutely right. I think it's also a culture and society shift as well to mm -hmm. where with the baby boomers, you had to get married. Yeah. And then get the house with the picket fence and the 2.5 kids and the dog, you know, and then your career. Where now millennials are like, well, hold on, I'm going to put that on pause. Right. I'm going I'm to I'm I'll pump the brakes on that. that. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to work on myself. I'm going to enjoy myself. If somebody wants to join me and be like that partner with me, cool. If, if not, not, we're good. I'm, hey, I'm good. Like, you know, and I got to give that to millennials to it. And that's what portion I was saying like, earlier, like, there's things that I love about millennials because of that, because it's like, you know what? I am secure by myself. I'm going to do this by myself and I'm not going to fall to the status quo, of just following suit and this, and this kind of thing that I don't fit into, you yeah. know, just pegging it in a round hole. It's like, no, they don't fit into it. So why do I want to keep on going and get the same result that my parents got? They're not happy. They got a house that they're stuck in. I don't want a house. And many millennials don't want to buy a crib no more. No, they get for what? I want to save my money. I'm going to get stuck fixing a roof or a furnace. <laughs> And, you know, it, it's funny that you say that. So I currently own my home and right. I'm thinking about moving back down south. And I was like, I'm not buying nothing no time soon. Because it's, it's so much easier to just call the landlord and be like, listen, my yes. pipe is not working. Can you send somebody? Yes. You know, plumbers are expensive. They are. Like you didn't, I didn't know that before moving into this situation, but it's just like, I don't want it. I don't no, want to be right. used to live here. I want to, if I, I want to pick up and move, I want the freedom to whenever yeah. I want. 
And pe- people give renting a bad rap because of that. They think, oh, every year rent's going to go up. But if you think about it, if you live in a subdivision, you're going to pay HOA, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to pay homeowner's insurance. It's more expensive than renter's insurance. You know what I'm saying? If something does break, you are the landlord. You got to call yourself. You, gotta t- you better text yourself to fix that plumbing, that <laughs> roofing problem. You know, you better have like 10 grand stash for that. Yeah. For real. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And just maintaining a house, painting it, you know, annually to make sure it doesn't rot. And then if you have all types of termites or whatever, and to your point, if I can just call up somebody, like, yo, I've already paid into this every month, come fix it. Yeah. You know, my dishwasher's out. Guess what? I got a brand new one coming. I'm I don't right. have to buy one. Fix this. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, you're obviously right with that. That's where you see it. You know, so what part of downside are you trying to come to? Charlotte. I Charlotte? lived there for about three years and I am making a comeback, baby. You, you're close to me. You're close to me. I'm Where? in Atlanta. Okay. So. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's part of it, too. Like, um, living in Charlotte, I would have access to my DC network, Charlotte and Atlanta. Yes. Um, a lot more easier than like Atlanta from DC is really difficult. It is. <laughs> like, that's, a, I'll actually be there next weekend, but that, that's a flight situation. Like, I'm not driving to Atlanta. No. Um, so yeah, no, definitely. And I lived in Charlotte, loved it, enjoyed it. I moved back because my little sister was starting high school and I wanted to be there for those moments. Um, but next week, Thursday, homie graduates. So (laughs) (laughs) no, I got family in Charlotte. I have my in-laws who live in Charlotte. They live right off of University Boulevard next to UNCC. Yeah. And, um, we all, me and my wife are always there's like a three hour drive from where we at in Atlanta. Exactly, exactly. You know, so it's it's pretty neat. But you're right, that's kind of that's central for you. Mm-hmm. You know, going back from DC and coming to Atlanta as well, and then if your sister's gonna be a, a film director, yeah. Atlanta's a spot. Exactly, and also while she's in school, she'll be so our full sales like right outside Orlando, so I'll be closer to her too. So um, yeah, that whole East yeah, I mean, Coast border Char- right there, you're good. <laughs> Absolutely. Char- and sure. you know, and, and Charlotte is on the come up big time right now. Definitely, definitely. There's a lot of stuff happening. Be Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's it's a lot of stuff happening in Charlotte. I love Charlotte. Um, and you know, this this is where I think also millennials tend to live in more cities than their parents did, because I, they, I agree. They, they don't feel stuck or anchored. Like having a home, you're kind of anchored. You know what I'm saying? And our and, priorities are a little different too. Like, I, absolutely. Are more of a social you know, connect, being able to go out, have fun, enjoy. And, and I think a lot of that is because we're still young. Yeah. Um, but, well, relatively young. Um, but, <laughs> uh, you know, just trying to live, like, live your best life is probably the tagline of millennials. <laughs> like, whatever. It's true, though, man. Because I think, I think people tend to think about, um, I was reading this book, Inspired Vulnerability by Brene Brown, right? And she talked about play and how there was this um, this researcher who did research about play. And she was confused, like, why would I want to, you know, read this book or do research about play? Mm-hmm. And it's not the play of sense of just being lazy, you know, or just doing nothing, just sitting on the fucking couch. Yeah. It's about honestly, like, injecting vacation time, injecting time. You know, vacation doesn't mean you have to go out of, out of the country. Vacation can be anything you desire it to be. You know, whether that's entertaining yourself, going to a venue like a concert or join your friends at some kind of pop up festival, mm-hmm. you know, just play and and having that engagement to where you can just release this, these stresses of life that you have, mm-hmm. you know, where to your point, the last generation of baby boomers, they kept that stress in and they brought that shit home. Yeah. yeah. You know, they never were able to get it out. So their motivation was just killed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? How can you get motivated? You got all this heavy weight of stress around you. And like when we should do with motivation and and helping out people understand, you know, where to where to kind of start and begin their path, helps them not fall into that old category or the baby boomers kind of created and yeah. to relieve that stress. Because play should be part of your your plan. Like, you know, when I, I plan my stuff out, I wasn't the pool, I'm going to the pool today. You know, yeah. so my, my son is graduating today at, at later on this afternoon. Congrats. So, um, you know, I'm going to go. See, he's actually going to want to go into Georgia State. Okay. And, nice. um, and I'm doing a podcast now. I got off at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but, but once we get off, I'm headed to the pool. Yeah, exactly. Then, <laughs> balance is everything. And I think part of it, because I'm a Libra, so I love balance, but I think balance is how you maintain hustle. 
Like yeah. if you're working 24 seven and you're not taking any, like that's why I work really, 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 really hard six days a week. And then on that seventh, yeah. I do nothing out of obligation. And I think um, it really helps maintain. And it's so funny. My best friend is my biggest accountability partner. Like she's that, like we consider ourselves life partners. Like we make joint decisions and everything. And she can <laughs> tell when I haven't had my day of rest. She's like, uh-uh, sis, what, mm-mm. When are you taking a day off? Cause I don't like this. <laughs> uh-uh, you did uh, no go on to set down. Um, so while she holds me accountable and pushes me when I don't feel like it, she's also the same person that holds me accountable to rest. She's also the same person that holds me accountable to my personal time. Um, and when I'm like, oh, I feel like I should be working, she's like, girl, sleep. Enjoy yeah. TV, you know, take a break, yeah. relax. So you, you, have, know, you have to reboot yourself. You have to rush, reboot yourself, because you you, you want to be your best self. Absolutely, absolutely. And, I have to be at this point, and so the only way I'm able to, you know, be the motivational speaker and you know put out uplifting video blogs three times a week, like the only way I'm able to do that is by making sure that I take care of myself. I get my massages every three weeks, like clockwork um i take my days off i i rest i turn my phone off when i don't feel like it like i i'm really really good at balancing the the difference between my hustle yep and you know my rest no yeah i think i think that's fantastic i think people need to stop glorifying exhaustion yeah because they do, they put out of stock into exhaustion. I'm like, I don't understand why. And you, and you, I, I guess I do get it because you have, you have some people out there who are famous. That 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 I guess you can say they're motivational speakers. Probably not, but people tend to listen to them anyway. Where they say, work, work, work. Mm-hmm. And other people are saying, well, take a time out, do X, Y, Z. You know, take time out and rest up. And they get confused. Yeah. And like I said earlier about the whole being busy just to be busy. To glorify that and to glorify exhaustion makes no fucking sense to me. I'm like, well, if you're exhausted, how good how good are you really are making decisions at that point? Yeah. You know, you're exactly. saying, oh, I'm, I'm getting, yeah, you're glorifying. I got four hours of sleep. Like that supposed to be something you, you should be proud of, proud of. When I'm like, no, you need you no know, six, seven, eight hours of sleep. Exactly. You know, you need your proper rest. You know, go you, get it. In order to be your best, you have to rest. And I, I sleep at a minimum six hours a night. Some nights are more. And for example, um, this week, actually, I had a half day at work and it was a really stressful week. I slept from 2 p.m. until my alarm went off the next day. Like you have to catch up every once in a while because you cannot function without sleep. But also, if you're going to sleep, sleep. Like Mm -hmm. a lot of times people want their eight hours of sleep, but then they spend two hours about to go to bed you know what I mean? Two hours trying to get up. Like when I wake up, I'm up. Yeah. When I decide I'm wake when I decide I've had enough rest, I get up and hustle. Yeah. And when it's time for me to go to sleep, I stop and I go straight to sleep. Like I literally, so I I set a timer on my TV. I can set it for 30 minutes and not see it turn off. Yeah. Because once I've decided to go to sleep, I'm asleep. Yeah. I I've went I went to the extent of taking the TV out of my room. I get it. I get Cause, it. Because now my room is not a place for me to like to hang out in. That's yeah. a place for me to really just sleep. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's for me to just like every place else in the room or my designated office area or, or studio I have now is like that's my work zone. Yeah. You know, so I'm separating myself into these zones on purpose. So I'm like, you know, I don't bring my laptop into my bedroom anymore. You know what I'm saying? If I'm going to have my phone with me into the bedroom, I'm not looking at it. It's going to go to the nightstand. It's going to go to vibrate. If I miss your call, oh well, I'll catch you in the morning. If I, if you text me, yeah. Great. When I get up, you know, you you get a return response within 24 hours. Exactly. You know so, what I'm saying? And it goes back to setting those boundaries. Yeah. With, you know, you're not working in your bedroom and, you know, not having your phone glued to your hip. Like studies show that your brain, it, it doesn't matter whose phone it is. If there is a phone next to you, your brain starts going off. Like, mm-hmm. oh, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? And, you know, we've become addicted to our phones, but also... You know, even just as simple as sleeping with your phone on silent across the room. Yeah. And so, like, my phone goes on do not disturb. It's a scheduled do not disturb, you know, at when Mm -hmm. I 
shut down and when I, you know, I'm waking up. But I've learned to sleep with it on the bed, like on my dresser across right. the room, because one, when my alarm goes off, I have to get up to turn it off. Right. And so now that I'm up, I'm less likely to hit snooze. Like when it's in my bed and I and I can hit a button. <laughs> It's over, yeah. <laughs> it, that, that, you know, it gets a little later, but when I sleep with it on the dresser, like I have to get up in order to turn it off. And also, I'm not reaching for my phone in the middle of the night. Yeah, which is, it tends to be a bad habit. Like the phone is just, man, it's, it's like a drug. You're addicted to it. Yeah. You know, and you're scrolling like, through Instagram well, just to scroll to see shit or Twitter. And it's like, what are you looking for? You haven't found it. It's almost like open the refrigerator 17 times thinking that something new going to pop up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly, <laughs> and it doesn't. It like, does. All the things we t- we spoke about so far. Are these are all the pieces of information and tools you give to your clients as well? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and when, obviously we go in depth. We'll have like week long conversations about networking, week long conversations about self care, week long conversations about finances. Like I take I take a topic, um, and I build it progressively, but we go one topic at a time and really do a deep dive and really just expanding their mindset so that they can make applicable steps for sure. Right. What was that, I guess, your most challenging client? The client that I had to have a heart to heart with. Uh, She's been the most difficult client to date. Um, And it really got to a point where I had to set boundaries as her coach. And I told her, I said, I'm not going to chase you for your homework. The homework that I assigned is for you. It's not for me. I said, if you're not going to do it, I'm at the point where I can't care. Like, I'm not going to chase you for your homework. I'm not going to chase you to pay your bills that you said you would pay. Um, I'm not going to chase you to put in the work after our calls. I'm not, like, I'm just not because I cannot care more than you care. And it's a delicate dance because... I care, right? Like that's who I am as a person and I do genuinely care, but I also have to balance my self-care and understanding that if she doesn't want it bad enough, like I told her, I was like, listen, we can continue on just a personal level and I can walk you through those steps. But if you're going to choose to continue on the business development piece, you got to step it up. And so far she has. That's that's where the accountability comes in. That's when you, you, yeah. That's when you let somebody know that yeah. And then, again, people aren't used to that, right? Exactly, exactly. Accountability is such a foreign thing for a lot of people, um, but it's such a game changer. Oh, absolutely. Because it, it it puts you on on, on front street. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. It puts you on front street. And you're like, man, damn, they just got the spotlight on me. Like no one ever done that. Like because some people tend to be like that strong person in the family. Yeah, that and nobody's everyone's afraid them. of, you know, saying to you don't challenge them, don't test them, and when someone comes from the outside like yourself, and you poke the bear, and yeah. they're soft as shit, you're like, oh, we're like, hold on, you're not supposed to poke me. Yeah, <laughs> I've never been poked before. But. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and a lot of people have a lot of bark and no bite. And yeah. Yeah. You can bite me if you want to. I, it doesn't bother me. If I'm in, a, if I'm in your life to hold you accountable, I'm holding you accountable. Okay. And I really just had to. I explained to all my clients, like, listen, like. I'm your coach, but I have people hold me accountable too. Yeah. You know, like no one likes accountability. No. We like the results of accountability. And so, you know, when you know someone's checking and you know someone's willing to ask those tough questions, you step up whether they ask the question or not, just because you know that they could. Right. And that's what pushes people is you're not always going to feel like it. And a lot of people try to hold themselves accountable. It's not as effective because when you don't feel like it, like, for example, my best friend is the one to be like, uh, uh-uh, we are not going out to eat. You said you was working on your finances. You was saving money. You were going to eat at home. You, you know, like, yeah, we can convince ourselves to justify this, that or the third. But accountability is going to ask those tough questions and hold you accountable to what you said you wanted in the first place. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. It really does. Like, you know, um, like I held myself accountable this year. I've always been an avid reader. But the past couple of years, I've got to say, like, I, I bought books I didn't read. 
You know what I'm saying? You, know, you go to Barnes and Nobles, you buy a stack of books. I'm gonna read all these books. I'm gonna get these books. And then, oh yeah. yeah. And then there's a cinema bookshelf for the rest. I'm like, so this past year I've been catching up on those books. Good, good. good. And then at the same time I've been actually doing more audio books. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I was like, you know what? If instead of me you know, working out some music, I was like, you know what? Let me listen to podcasts. Let me do audio books. Mm-hmm. Let me use my time. So now I stopped driving to work and I just take the bus to work now. And it, I'm actually enjoying yeah. it yeah. because I'm like. It's time for myself. I'm walking. You know what I'm saying? It's putting me in a different mental state. I'm listening to these audio books at the same time. I'm learning more. It's giving me time. And I don't mind a little longer commute. It's just not long. It's just 30 minutes. I live 15 minutes from where I work at. <laughs> so it's not that far. But it's just, again, it gives me that kind of that away time from everything. If it, now that's the time for myself as well in between exactly. time. Exactly. You know? A lot less. And there's no excuse. Yeah. For sure. Uh, one of my coaches, he sold his car. He lives in like downtown DC and he sold his car. He's like, listen, when I, if I need to go somewhere far, I Uber or I take the Metro and yeah. I can be getting work done. That's why I do it. When I go to Charlotte, I just rent the car when I go to Charlotte. Yeah, exactly. That, and that's really it. Like, you know, so one, I give myself a raise cause I got rid of my car. So now I don't have to worry about car note and car, car insurance. Notes or car insurance. Exactly. You know, so I just give myself an instant raise by doing that. And again, th- these are choices that, I don't think I would have made years ago because I, I wasn't secure of myself. I wasn't secure with my finances. I wouldn't, I didn't have no direction yeah. that I wanted to go. I would know I was on, I was on a path that really wasn't my path, you know, especially in the hip hop culture. They always say, yo, you know, stay in your lane. And I hate that reference. Yeah. I really, I really don't like it because to me, it's like, you tell me to stay in my lane. That means you tell me I can't explore the other lanes next to me. Yeah. Or I can't, I yeah. can't explore to go off this next exit to see what else is off, off of here. You know what I'm saying? And then I was speaking to somebody about that a couple of weeks ago. And he was like, but now I'm in this lane. I said, yeah, I said, but not in your lane no more. Like, you know, you know, you if you were to stay in this lane and traffic would have built up, but this lane is moving, are you still going to stay in this damn lane? Like, you know, you're slowing yourself down. I'm like, and, and I was like, we tend to just listen to people because they're famous mm-hmm. and, and, they're, and, it, and it sounds good, mm-hmm. right? And I'm like, when are you going to start thinking for yourself? When are you going to really start taking your own advice? And because honestly, you listen to all these other people, you're still not doing what they're doing anyway, right? Exactly, exactly. And I think for me, like, it's great to listen to famous people, but I think you also have to choose wisely. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, when I think about, you know, I look at Michelle Obama, Candy Burris, Beyonce, Lisa Nichols. Like I think, I think about like these are women that I aspire to be like, so I can listen to them. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying, um, uh, am I taking advice from everybody? You're gonna get confused that way. Absolutely. Like that's a confusing situation. Like you can learn something from everybody, great, but you also have to filter it. Absolutely. You yes. have. To- like is this applicable for me like i've heard plenty of people say i'll sleep when i die no baby i'll sleep tonight <laughs> yeah, exactly. i'll sleep tonight okay thank you for asking <laughs> yeah I, I never got that that saying you know like really I said, that makes no damn sense to me at all you know like you see when you're, i say well you'd be more than sleeping you'd be you'd be dead like, you know, so like, it, you won't be sleeping either. Cool. <laughs> like, God bless America, but that don't work for me. No. I, I'm very cranky when I'm tired. I need sleep. Yeah. No, you're right. And this is where people, again, they they stop educating themselves. That's what happened. And then they take these snapshots of a verbiage, of language that someone says, and then they think, oh, I'm going to apply it to myself. But without no other just cause behind it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So if you're going to live your life via Snapchat, listen, it's it's your life. You can do whatever you want to do. Right, right. But you know don't get mad that you don't get the results. Yeah, don't get mad. Don't come at me that now you're hating me because you see me progressing mm-hmm. and you're falling behind when yeah. you could have been riding together. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Not, not in our, on the same path, but you could have been yours, I could have been doing mine, and we could have been riding together. Mm-hmm. And um, there's some people in my life I had to let go because of that. that listen, like, you know, love you to death, but man, like, I can't fuck with you anymore. Yeah. And listen, I can love you from a distance. And there are plenty of people I've had to just let go. Um, not because they did anything wrong, not because I did anything wrong, but we just we're not on the same path. And that's okay. Yeah. I'm still rooting for you. But like yeah. I I gotta root for me harder. 
And no, absolutely, you're absolutely right about that. You have to be your biggest fan. You have to be your biggest cheerleader. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to have your own fucking band behind yeah. you. Yeah. Um, and it it comes down for once you actually learn who you are, it does take time. You have to release a lot of shit. You have to confront a lot of shit about yourself too, about your past, about your current present, and even with the culture itself. You know that you know you're doing motivational speaking and stuff. I think in the culture itself though, therapy is kind of taboo. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that's where we have to get better at as well. So okay. it, for us to get to our next next phase in our best life. We need to let go of some of this baggage, like you said earlier in, in, our, in the beginning of our, our conversation, where, you know, all of us have baggage. Absolutely. And when are we going to let go with that? Should come tired of traveling with that heavy ass baggage. It's heavy. Like, and it really is. And I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because I love discussing mental health, particularly within, you know, communities of color, because we don't do it enough. Yeah. Uh, and we look at it as a taboo subject when. It's really not. And I think we need to, as a culture, normalize it a little bit better. Um, I've dealt with depression, suicide, low self-esteem, the grief from miscarriage. Um, Like, I've dealt with a lot. And as young as my first suicidal attempt was at seven years old. Wow. Like, these are real issues that people are dealing with. And more specifically, our children are dealing with. And we can't rush it off. We have to get them help. Mm -hmm. And prayer is a beautiful thing, but faith without works is dead. Yeah, absolutely. Faith without works is dead. So I grew up in a Christian in a Christian home. I, I am a Christian, and I believe in the power of God, but I also know that God created therapists for a reason. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's- like, and and a lot of times we miss the fact that most therapy is free under your health insurance. Right. And a lot of times people have the difficulty of, well, I don't know how to find the right person. My recommendations, find somebody that you identify with racially and gender. Yes. I was and, just about to say that. And you have to interview people. That's what it comes down to. You're interviewing a therapist. So if you have to go three, four, or five of them, that's fine. Well, find your right one. one. Go for it. Exactly. And then spend your time. I think because people tend to correlate therapy with being crazy. And it's not. It's, it's way it's not it's beyond that. It's a yeah. safe space to be vulnerable and deal with your issues because we all have issues. If you're perfect, fine. You don't need therapy. But I don't know anybody who's perfect. No. Neither do I. And and it comes down to that where people have to be honest with themselves. And I think other, I think people tend to think too that therapists don't give advice. That's mm-hmm. not their job. Pretty much you they're they're helping you find the answers within yourself. Exactly. They're they're exposing you. Yeah, definitely. And they're 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 exposing you for that reason, so you can self reflect. Yep. And even when you're not dealing with a like, for example, after I miscarried my twins, I was in therapy every week, literally every week. And then it got to a point where I was, you know, okay, and I'm like, all right, cool. Now let's go work on some of this baggage. Like Mm -hmm. now that we're okay in the present. Let's go visit the past for a second and let's work on some of those issues. Like my daddy issues were a huge result of me getting therapy. Now I have a relationship with my father. Whereas in the past, I was holding on to the hurt, the pain, the disappointment, the anger, the frustration. And she helps me unpack some of that. And that's what it's about, you know, facing that that stuff. You you saw that there was a challenge for you. You saw that, you know what? I can't handle this on my own. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. Let me go get some professional assistance with that to help to help me just unravel that. Tell me un- unpack that. And uh, it comes down to just having techniques. It comes down to just to speaking to someone who's not in the know, who's not there, who's not part of the family. You know, talk talking to that person has no connection. Since mm-hmm. that's is the best avenue of, for you to get results that you want for yourself. For sure, and I agree completely. And I think a lot of people minimize that. Um, but really and truly, we all have baggage and you also have to be aware of your history, too. So, for example, my father's mother and my mother's father were both hospitalized for mental health. Mm. That means I'm at a greater risk, especially when I factor in the fact that I've dealt with it my whole life. Right. 
So I have family history and I have personal history. So when I found out I was pregnant with the twins, I specifically started seeing a therapist because I knew I was at a greater risk for postpartum depression. And I wanted to get through it before. And I'm glad that I made that decision because I didn't know how that story was going to end. Right. Right. Um, But it got to the, you know, had I started therapy after miscarrying the twins, it wouldn't have been as effective because I didn't have that working relationship. Right. But by the time I had the miscarriage, I'd been seeing her for months and on a weekly basis for months because, you know, all the things that were going on and, you know, it was completely free under my health insurance. So why not? (laughs) You know? No, yeah. She got her money. I didn't have to pay her money. God bless America. It's a win. Um, but having that rapport and that relationship, I could be honest with her about what I was experiencing before all hell broke loose in my life. And you don't know when hell is going to break loose. So why not have a working relationship with someone deal with your baggage in the meantime. And then if something comes up, you can deal with that in a way where you already have a trusting relationship. No, you, you just spot on with that spot on. Like, I, I love that. I think, you know, when people do things, they have to do things on purpose. It's like, you know, if I'm going to go to the gym, mm-hmm. I'm going to go to a gym that I know I have to pass the gym first before I get to my house. Yeah, that helps. <laughs> you know, um, if you're going to go to therapy, get get a therapist that's around your home. So there's no excuse. Say, no, it's on the other side of town. I can't make it type of thing. Like, you really have to put things in your way. Like I said, take that bumpy road. Yeah. You know, and put those things in place for a reason. So then you know there's no excuse Mm -hmm. at that point. That you know, if you pass it, that's because you're mentally saying that I don't want to succeed, I don't want to get better, that I'm okay being in this rut. And if you ask your case, then you don't want to losing a lot of people around you. Mm -hmm. You know, no one's going to want to hear how you couldn't make it this year. You know, because every day is a new year. I hate when people make a resolution on New Year's, and I'm like, yo, every day is a brand new year. Exactly. Exactly. And you brought up a really great point that I would like to highlight. I think the more self-aware you are and you understand your strengths and your weaknesses, so you can highlight your strengths. Great. Cool. When it comes to understanding your weaknesses, it's not about beating yourself up. It's Mm -hmm. about coming up with a plan that accounts for your weaknesses. So just like you said, there are some people who love working out and will travel 30 minutes to get to the gym. Exactly. But if you're not that person, you need to make it as convenient as possible. That should be the next fucking store to you. Exactly. <laughs> your gym bag needs to stay in the trunk. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? You need to always have your clothes with you. It needs to be conveniently located. Maybe even buy your favorite restaurant. You know, like reward yeah. yourself. Whatever it takes. Um, and also accountability. So for the month, of, I'm not the biggest workout person. I like the results of working out. And I like to eat. So I work out. Okay? <laughs> The month you like, of- like to maintain. Exactly. <laughs> you get it. Um, but for the month of May, I challenge myself to run a mile a day for the month of May. For you. It ain't been easy. And I'm really trying to figure out why May is taking so long to end. I'm like, God, this is the yeah, longest. A lot I've- more days ago. <laughs> <laughs> the longest month I've ever experienced in my life. Um, but, you know, on day three, I think I put it out there on Facebook. I was like, hey, guys. I'm doing this challenge. Does anyone want to join me? And a couple of people put out there like, yes, I'll I'll do it. Like, I can't do a mile, but I'll do half a mile. I can't do running, but I'll walk a mile. I can't, you know, do running, but I'll bicycle a mile. You know, whatever kind of variation works for you. And now we have a Facebook group where we post every day. We post our results. And on the days where, even though this was my idea, on the days when I don't feel like it and I see those notifications on Facebook, I'm like, oh, let me get my ass up. Go get this mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and it really have to understand what your weaknesses are so that you can account for them. You just said something about this Facebook group that really kind of get me thinking. Do you. I guess guide people to 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 be part of some kind of social group, whether you know I don't care if it's a biker group, you know what I'm saying whatever whatever social group it's out there, whether it's in person or like a Facebook group, yeah. because as humans we're tribal people. Exactly. You know so, and people like to say, oh no, I'm a loner, and I've always said that my whole damn life, but then I always find myself around my family, so that I'm not too much of a fucking loner, exactly. right? So, 
you know, and and even to now, like my wife and I said, no, we need to find a new group of friends. Let's just join a group. Let's join something. Yeah. You know, even like with, with with schools, you have fraternities and sororities. You know, it's for that very reason. Exactly. You know, you get to have your counterparts with you. That's that's either thinking or playing in the same space that you're playing in. You know, how 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 do you interject that to someone or even make them think of that? Yeah, I think it's definitely a game changer. Um, and especially when I think about the connections that I have at being part of my sorority. Um, I've been in my sorority 2010, so I'm coming up on nine years. And I, a lot of the connections that I have came from my sorority. Right. A lot of my mentors, um, a lot of my, you know, support system, a lot of my encouragement have come from the sorority sisters that I've met while at Tech, while, um, you know, I live in Maryland and when I was in Charlotte, like my best friend is my soror, um, you know, and so, and a lot of my really, really close people are my sorority sisters. So if you've ever thought about joining a fraternity or sorority, I definitely recommend it. Um, it's not for everybody. That's why I say if you've ever right. wanted to, I think you should. Um, but I will also say, you know, different communities are, are definitely helpful. And the reason why is you want to surround yourself with people who force you to level up a little bit. Yeah. You want to surround yourself with people who make you step on your tippy toes for a second, just to be able to have a conversation with them. For example, when I think of my closest circle, right. One of them, she she's a motivational speaker. She's a video blog. She's a written blogger, um, and she's a mom, and she's killing the game, like killing it. And she's my inspiration to like when I feel like I'm doing too much, I look at her and I'm like, she's doing everything I'm doing, and she's a phenomenal mother. <laughs> like I have no room to complain, and she pushes <laughs> me like no other. Um, also a sober. Then my best friend, who is a sober, she. Um, She's working on going to medical school. She's working on being a pers- a physical trainer. And, you know, she's always requiring, you know, more for right. sure. Um, I have another good friend who's a lawyer and he's my lawyer. Listen, if I ever say my lawyer's on speed dial, please understand. I really <laughs> not- That's real talk right there. You heard it first. <laughs> it's nothing but a phone call. OK, um, but he's an attorney and he's opening his own practice this month. You know, um, I have another my business partner. He's a motivational speaker and a life coach. Um, and he we have a, po- a video podcast together. Uh, I guess it's not a podcast if it's a video, but uh, we have a YouTube channel that we go together. The link um, L-I-N-K. Um, we work together on a lot of different projects, workshops like we're always pushing each other. Wow. And. and you know, he pushes me, I push him and vice versa. Um, I have another good friend. She's a medical doctor. Um, we've known each other since it was my senior year at tech and she was starting her post back program and going like, I feel like I got a medical degree, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and just experiencing that life together. And so when I look at my circle, I can't afford to take my foot off the pedal. Right. Because I'm going to get left behind. Like, yes, we're doing all these different things. But I don't want to get left behind. You know what I mean? And Absolutely. we feel that way. And so, you know, my circle, some of them know each other, some of them don't. But at the same time, it's still that same reciprocal energy. You know what I mean? Like they yeah. look at what I'm doing and they're like, damn, I need to, I need to, I need to, you know what I mean? And so we push each other to the next level. And one thing that I will say, studies show that if you look at your life 10 years from now, your annual salary will be within a thousand dollars of the average of your five closest friends. What that means to me is who you hang around matters. You yeah. may not be doing all the same things. Like we can track money. We can, we can measure money. Right. It's measurable. Absolutely. It's a measurable factor, but you don't just show up with the money 10 years later. You know what I mean? It's that mindset, it's that encouragement, it's that hustle, it's that energy. And it pushes you to say, no, I'm going to fight for that promotion. No, I'm going to fight for that business. No, I'm going to fight for that degree. And and that's how you end up. So you really want to think about like, okay, let me look at my five closest friends right now. What's their average annual salary? Give or take. Because I don't like talking about money with friends. I think it gets a little... little... Yeah. Get those sticky. 
specifics. I, I don't need specifics. Yeah. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, like, what's the five, you know, what's that average? Am I comfortable with that? Are they on track to make more? Am I on track to make more? And am I comfortable with where we're on track to be? So when I think about my closest friends, I got two medical doctors, lawyer, entrepreneur, and two entrepreneurs. You know what I mean? Like, we're we going to be good. <laughs> we get, we get if it's not pretty right now, yeah. we're going to be good. Absolutely. Like, and that. And then you also have to think about, like, if these are my five closest friends, right? Who are our kids hanging around? Exactly. Who's pouring into my children's life? Yeah, greatness is going to beget greatness. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what I'm talking about. So, like, the fact that, you know, I I know for a fact that I can grow up, I can raise children and be able, comfortably be able to say, like, anything that you want to do, I'm connected to somebody who can mentor you through that process. Right. Like that's what it's about. That's how you start generational wealth through connections and access. For example, if I had a child who wants to be an attorney, you can bet your ass my I'm gonna have a job somewhere. Where at my best friend's law firm? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you sit and he gonna take care of my child because that's family at that exactly. point. Exactly. So, you know, just really thinking about that and, you know, even with the medical field, like so much of the medical field is on mentorship. Well, my mama's best friend is a doctor. Connections. I'm going to be okay, you know. So it's really just about living your best life and then connecting yourself to people who are doing their best version of themselves. We don't all have to be doing the same things, but we have to be the best we can at what we're doing. You, you, you're right. You're absolutely right. I love that. Damn, you're freaking amazing, man. <laughs> Thank you. Fuck, you're amazing. Shit. I appreciate it. No, and- it, this is great stuff, man, because yeah. this is what people need to hear. Yeah. You know, this is what women need to hear. People of color need to hear. You know, um, they need to see people successful. They need to see people doing other things. Like, you know, no doubt, I, you know, I, I've. I've read books from Tony Robbins to Gary V. Mm-hmm. And they're cool. And I'll, I'll still use inspiration, but it's different when you see your face. Yeah. You yeah. know what I'm saying? A makes- reflection of that person on stage or in that book or whatever it is. You just tend to feel like, all right, this is this yeah. is my people. And that's why I like to look at so a lot of my quote unquote mentors are women of color mm-hmm. who started from nothing. Right. Beyonce started from nothing. Lisa Nichols started from nothing. Um, Michelle Obama started from nothing. Candy Burris started from nothing. Because I don't want to feel like that's unattainable. Mm-hmm. But if you study who you like, they started from nothing and now they have generational wealth. Correct. How do, now let me study how you got there. Yeah. Because success always leaves clues. And not even just from a famous person's perspective. I also think about the fact that, like, my mother has owned her own accounting business for 20 years. And has been doing it full time for 15. Amazing. Like, I think about that. I think about my aunt on my father's side who has been a hairdresser and has her had her own business as far as I could possibly fathom. Right? I think about my grandmother who's been a writer her whole life. You see what I'm saying? I love that, yeah. I was literally my grand my father's father was a motivational speaker. Like <laughs> I was literally built for this life. Yeah, you are. And, you have that legacy. And I had that legacy, but who would I be to not be the best version of that? You yeah. know what I mean? Because I also have a legacy that I need to leave. I have a little sister who looks up to me to understand what does black girl magic look like. Right. You know what I mean? I have eight nieces and nephews. My oldest nephew is seven. I have eight nieces and nephews, and I want to be able to say, by the time they graduate high school, I want to be able to say, cool, if you want to go to school, I'll pay for your education. If you want to start a business, I'll invest in your business, and I'll help you get it off the ground. Like, I want to be able, I want, when my sister graduates from wholesale, I want to be able to pay her bills for the next year, two, three, however long to avoid her having to get a regular job just to pay bills. Yeah, absolutely. I want her to focus on her craft. I want her to make it, you know, make it doing what you love. And that pushes me. So yes, I come from a legacy, 
But I'm trying to create an even better legacy. I'm trying to make sure the next generation is set up for success. By the time I have kids, I want to be in a position to build a school before they start school. You know what I mean? I don't trust the education system. Yeah, I hear that. Yeah. I don't. But these are the things that push me. I'm like, okay, I got at a minimum five years. You know what I mean? Like, I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kicking in gear, man. You know, and, and you know, I'm not <laughs> expecting or anything like that, but I'm just saying, like, you're not doing enough. I, I, I gotta hustle, <laughs> like, owning a school, like, I, uh, the things that I want to do in this world push me. Like, if yeah. I were to show you my five year plan, you'd be like, how you gonna do all this? Listen, I got this, okay? Yeah. We're gonna make this work. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I think that's what people really don't understand. Like, whether you, whether you do a vision board, or you do a five-year plan, like having something booked for next year is an amazing feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you say, damn, I got work for next year. Already oh, lined up, yeah. Oh, oh, already lined up, like I already, got, already have commitments. Mm -hmm. That makes you feel like, you know what, damn, I am I am good. Yeah. So, you know, that self-doubt tends to get pressed down. Yeah. And you start, you know, your, your, your value starts raising, you start floating, you know what, let's, let's get another date on the books again. You know what I'm saying? And the challenge at that point is getting dates, you know, dates in the calendar. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's the biggest goal. Listen, when Drake said he was booked up for the next two years, like I'm like, goals. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I'm looking goals. at. Goals. I'm like, man, how can I how can I get booked up for the next two years? Like exactly. um even I uh, listen to Kevin Hart, he was even saying like he's booked up for I think for two next two, three years. Like he's already has things yeah. scheduled. Like it's like yeah. boom, 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 boom. Like I'm like Damn, like you 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 you're booked until 2022. Holy shit! Like, yeah. like and, so, and a lot of times we look at that and we're like, damn, I could never. But you got to backtrack a little bit. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Like absolutely. It, it's one thing to say like, okay, Drake being booked for the next two years. Okay, but let's backtrack to wheelchair Jimmy. Yeah, exactly. The you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yep. And even not even that far. Backtrack to me, Drake. You know what I mean? Like, let, let, you know, we really have, like, use it as inspiration, but don't let these people become, like, superheroes. Yeah, you're right. And, and, and we tend to glorify these folks a little too much. Yeah. And, and, and that's where it stagnates our growth. Exactly. So that's why I'm saying, like, my mentors, like, my, my mentors all started from nothing because I don't want to feel like something's out of my reach. Like if you can get there at that in your lifetime, that means I have the ability because we all have access to the same 24 hours. And like even with Beyonce, for example, we want to talk about how she made so much money off of one Coachella performance. Homie brought in $78 million, $68 million just for a two hour performance. But what about the eight months that she worked on that performance? Yeah. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like you can you can decide whatever side of that coin you want to go to, but when I think about eight months for a two hour performance, that tells me you could be as talented as you want, but you still have to perfect your craft. You said because the hard work doesn't go away. You gotta put the hard work in. Exactly. No matter where you get to, you still have to put in that work. And so I watched Homecoming and I was like, all right, <laughs> like yeah. let's get to work. Like I was yeah. They're like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And it was a phenomenal performance and you can get wrapped up in that or you can hear what she said. Yeah, because she, she even felt insecure. She had just given birth. Yeah. And she felt insecure about her body. She was like, um, I'm not recovering as fast as other people did. Mm -hmm. And you're not supposed to be like other people. Exactly. And she was willing to do whatever it took. Like, yeah. can I go through the Beyonce diet? I don't know if I want it that badly. <laughs> I really don't. Like, But if I wanted it that badly... Yeah. Good. You know. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. <laughs> and, and it really is a matter of what results do you want and how quickly do you want them? No, you're right. I think also people need to understand that it's all about that resources are available to you. And you have to go sort out those resources. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, it, and you can't just say, what was me that I don't have that. No, you can't have that. Maybe, at the, I'm not, maybe I'm not at the same level as a, having an in-house personal trainer. But you can get still a personal trainer if you need to. Exactly. Planet you know Fitness saying? has it for free, and that's ten dollars a month. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So the resources are there. Yeah. There's no excuses for that. 
Exactly. Exactly. But we like to take comfort in excuses because they make us feel good. Yeah, it's, it's it's that kind of comfy soft blanket, you know what I'm saying? It just makes you feel good and say, you know what? This is my little kind of my little force field. If I say this, it's gonna excuse me from doing be, do, being this. Or if yeah. I call off work for the next six weeks in a year, you know, I'm gonna hate my job, but I'm still gonna go and then be surprised when I get fired. Mm-hmm. You know, th- there's a problem there. Exactly, and that's why we need accountability because we're not always gonna want it for ourselves. No, we're not, man. Yo, this has been a great conversation, yo. I agree. I love it. <laughs> I want you to come back on. I'd be happy to. Listen, you said the time and date, and I, I'm with it. Dope. Like you know, I, I know you've been you've been amazing. Um, I I think everyone needs to follow you. I'm put I'm gonna put all your web. You have your website. You have your IG. You have your your YouTube channel on. Yeah. Put all that in the show notes. Everyone's gonna be able to find, uh, um, uh, Tiara, and and your YouTube channel is Nicole's work uh, network. Yep. And um. It's great, great channel. I I, I love the, the 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 daily setups that you have with the, yeah. with the the goal settings and the inspiration, and people need to see that. If, you, if you're not, if you, if you haven't you know uh, seen it yet, you need to subscribe yeah. now. Yeah. Like you need to subscribe like right away. If you haven't subscribed, what the fuck are you waiting for? Like just do it. I like agree. commit, and then hit the little bell to get notifications. So then yeah. when she hits up a new video, it's up there. Like you're the like first. You are, amazing i appreciate that i i really do um and yes you can all of my social media handles are at nicole's network n-i-c-o-l-e-s network um youtube facebook linkedin uh twitter instagram you name it i'm there um and really the biggest benefit is to make sure that i'm doing my part to be a light in this world right. what you focus on will grow so if Absolutely. you focus on the positive, if you focus on the good, if you focus on the progression, um, you'll get more of that. And so that's definitely my goal. And yes, please subscribe, um, subscribe, 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 because it helps me continue to do more. Right. Absolutely. So yes, please make sure you subscribe on YouTube, um, share the video, like the video, comment on the video. I'm always open to discussions. I'm always open to healthy and respectful debates. So you don't have to agree with me. We can talk about it in the comments um, for sure. And I like having people on, so we might have to work on that too. Um, but definitely, uh, you know, comment your thoughts, agree, disagree, you know, share it with somebody who needs it. Um, but definitely we need more positivity in this world. So, um, you know, I'm just trying to do my part for sure. No, you definitely are. You definitely are that beacon of light. You definitely that that energy that um that is needed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that that's what you're providing everyone and providing for yourself. It's amazing to see someone or, or like like yourself just kind of soar. Yeah. So yeah. you know, I want to continue kind of watching your path and really just be like your cheerleader and be like, man, I you know, it. you're dope. You're dope as shit. I, I don't care. It. You're just dope. Yeah, and loving me, <laughs> I do no about loving loving she going to Charlotte this year. So we got to work on that one and and including you in that. For sure. Yeah, no, definitely. When you get to Charlotte, um, I'll be doing in-person interviews hopefully by the end of the summer. Okay, perfect. And my studio will be up. And right now it's kind of a it's a makeshift studio. Gotcha. So I tore down my dining room and um, I'm gonna tear I'm gonna tear it apart again. Yeah. And then I'm gonna start doing in-house um, um, podcasts. So uh, once that happens, I'm definitely gonna invite you. So yeah. we're definitely gonna be in touch, man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, this has been a great conversation for sure. No, definitely. I can't wait for our next one. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. I'll check you out. All right. Bye. All right, bye.